All right, we got a long problem ahead. Um, I'll have to include a couple notes in the description for this one as well. So be aware of that if you want more info. Let's start with the statement. So imagine an iron sphere of radius big R that carries a charge big Q and is uh, and a uniform magnetization. We haven't seen that in a little while. Big M is equal to uh, M in the Z hat direction. The sphere is initially at rest. Okay, all these things need to be taken into account for when we go to initial conditions on those integrals. So A, compute the angular momentum stored in the electromagnetic fields. B, suppose the sphere is gradually and uniformly demagnetized. Ooh, what a weird little switch here instead of the field going away. But we'll see how they tie together. Use Faraday's law to determine the induced electric field and find the torque this field exerts on the sphere and calculate the total angular momentum imparted to the sphere in the course of the demagnetization. Okay, and part C, suppose instead of demagnetizing the sphere that we discharged it by connecting a grounding wire to the North Pole. Assume the current flows over the surface in such a way that the charge density remains uniform. Use the Lorentz force to determine the torque on the sphere and calculate the total angular momentum imparted to the sphere in the course of the discharge. The magnetic field is discontinuous at the surface. Does this matter? All right. Um, as always, uh, let's go ahead and draw out what we have. If we just have a sphere here, we know that some ring can be projected at some angle theta that covers the radius r. Um, and we'll just rotate that down to see that if we want some longitudinal slice of it, I hope I'm saying that one right, some slice, horizontal slice of it, that we have it at some angle. Again, we've seen this before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But um, we know the momentum density and the angular momentum density. We've seen it both in the last two problems, which, by the way, the diagram for this one can also help the last problem. But we'll go ahead and address this one. Um, just let's be mindful that we saw how the fields interact with one another. Now we're dealing with the polarization and magnetization of them. So that inevitably will affect the fields, and that's where we first need to start. So for part A, the first thing we need to do is determine the fields of the sphere. Clearly for inside, there is no charge closed, so it goes away. For the electric field outside, we have the whole charge enclosed, so that's Q over R squared, uh, times 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught in Gaussian units. Cool stuff there, we've seen it before. Now, something you might not remember is that from chapter 5 and 6, we saw that uh, B is equal to 2 thirds mu naught M. Here we know what M is, it's just M in the Z at direction. Now, outside, we can use the field of a dipole for outside, and that's what we're doing here. Um, but remember, you can represent that in a coordinate-free form or in this form here. Uh, since we have a uh, certain symmetry, a sphere, that's easier to do with R and theta hat um, components, where a little m is the magnetization. Um, so if... Uh, we want little m to be equal to the total magnetization, which is 4 pi, or excuse me, 4 thirds pi r cubed, the whole sphere times the magnetization constant m. Again, we've seen these before in chapters, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but understand those things will be flip-flopped quite frequently. So if we want to find the density, momentum density, we're going to take the cross product of these fields, both inside and outside. Clearly for the inside one, with e being zero, that makes work really easy. So we're going to focus our efforts on the outside. And uh, as you see, I use parentheses for both respective fields. A lot of the stuff is constant. And so we just need to take the cross product, but we have to distribute that cross product from the electric field R hat to the magnetic field R hat and the magnetic field theta hat. All right, so which uh, works out very well because once we simplify, we see that we have mu naught over 4 pi squared uh, m, q, again, m is not the mass, q over r to the fifth power. And what's really cool here is that we know that the cross product of a vector in itself goes to zero. They have to be orthogonal in order to have anything. Remember, uh, a cross b is equal to a b sine theta. If the angle is the same, it, sine goes to zero, so we have a zero there. And uh, we know that r cross theta gives us our third spherical uh, di or direction, which is phi hat. So we get a nice little... Uh, cross product result there surprisingly nice makes you worried all right so then the momentum density is well now we just got to take the cross product to get with r, r r hat with this density g 
So again, all the constants flood out. We can reduce the R. Uh, we can cancel the R from the R vector. And um, with the R to the fifth power. And then we're just left with R hat cross phi hat. Which, um, again, we know that phi cross R gives us theta. But this, in order to switch it, since cross products are anti-commutative, we have to put a negative sign there. Nothing too big of a deal, but needs to be aware anyways. Uh, the only component that survives integration, which again, this is a big trick, and we'll come back again and again and again, is that uh, due to the fact that the spherical components, spherical, uh, 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 spherical unit vector components are composed of Cartesian coordinates with sines and cosines, the integration over two pi, 0 to 2 pi and 0 to pi will cancel out a lot of those things. So it's important to note that here that the only part that will survive the integration is the z component. So what we say here is that the negative uh, z or negative theta hat in the z direction is equal to negative times negative sine theta, which gives us positive sine. Okay, from that we can go ahead and get a sine squared, which we plug into the integral. That's a whole lot of stuff to uh, get through, but trust me, that trick will save you a lot of time. Furthermore, uh, we see that the R squares from the uh, differential element, d tau, cancels with two factors, the R over 4. And uh, yeah, we see we get a ton of um, constants getting moved through. So that's mu naught mq over 4 pi squared in the z hat direction. And then we just split up the integral since our bounds aren't restrictive. And we get... Uh, a factor of 2 pi from the d phi, we get uh, 4 thirds from the sine cubed theta, d theta, and then the uh, 1 over r squared dr just gives us 1 over r. Again, then there is a negative sign there, but it cancels away with the infinity, and the double negative gives us a positive r, so go back to calculus if you need to. What's important to do now is that we see that we have a factor of 4 pi that cancels from the 2 pi integral d phi and the uh, four thirds from the sine but we have to plug in what m was which is four thirds pi r cubed times big m to write everything in terms of what we had so we get another factor of four pi that cancels um now that uh r cubed from the surface area or from the volume excuse me cancels with one of the r's from the integration and uh we simplify down to two ninths mu naught big m big Q, R squared, in the Z direction. All right, that was a lot, but pretty easy to do, I would say, once you have it set up. Now, if we were to apply Faraday's law to the ring in the diagram, okay, oops, what we see is that we have uh, the closed integral on the line, okay, is equal to negative d phi dt, okay, so the line element has to be R sine theta, and we see that that or excuse me, yeah, R sine theta for whatever radius it is. So in order to get the circumference of that, that's 2 pi times a new R, which is attended with sine theta. So that's where we get the sine theta from. Now, we know that the phi is equal to magnetic um, field flux. So the rate of change of that is equal to, um, is going to be related to the magnetization. So as you see, I, I kind of split it up since the field was constant. We brought it outside the integral, and then we got the integration part there. So I used under brace to save space. But we see that that time dependence goes to the magnetization term, which is what we expected. Okay, you see we get a factor of 2 pi canceling on both sides, a sine, and r canceling on both sides. So we just got to be very careful with that. Um, e here is therefore negative uh, mu naught over 3 times r sine theta d m d t in the fiat direction all right so df is equal to sigma e d a and if we plug all these in we get a sigma factor there d a and of course to find the torque we have to find r cross df plug it through again okay, we get this r cross phi uh cross product again as you know that gives us negative theta once again, we'll see that only one component survives integration, so we'll kind of expedite this process. Pull all the constants out front. You see we're in a little bit different situation here where we have a um, negative mu naught sigma, which is highlighted in red. We'll have to plug in the surface charge there, just like we did for the magnetization earlier. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and simplify down what we can. 
Once we do that, you see we have a four pi and an r cube or r squared that cancels out from that sigma. So that simplifies things down nicely. Um, and as you see, the torque is equal to negative two mu naught over n qr squared dm dt in the z hat direction. So these things are looking quasi formulaically compar uh, comparable. We like that. And of course, we need to find the uh, rate of change per time, uh, or rather we need to find the integral with the time element to find the angular momentum. Now remember, we add all the magnetization to start, so that's the lower limit, and it goes to zero as we demagnetize. So that's how we set up our limits on the integral, which again, that'll cancel out the negative signs we see. And as you probably have suspected, we will indeed get a two over nine times mu naught mqr squared in the z hat direction, matching what we found from the fields earlier. That is pretty remarkable. Um, a little note here for part C is that if we let the charge in sphere at time t be qt, the charge density is qt over four pi r squared. The charge below or south of the ring in the figure is, well, q south is equal to q uh, times that radius or area component rather. So two pi big R squared and then zero to pi for the prime angle so we know exactly where we're at. And if we do that, we get Q over two since we can split it up into two where theta equals the polar angle. So if we're at the top, you know, you get one and one so you get all of charge. If you're at the bottom, you get none of the charge. Makes sense. Um, so physically this result makes sense if we just play with the angles with respect to theta and cosine, how they interact, nothing too big of a deal. So the total current crossing through the ring, flowing north, so to speak, is I of t is equal to negative one half dt over, or dq over dt, uh, one plus cosine theta, and hence, if we look at the surface current, kt, that's just I over two pi r sine theta, again, the circumference, um, in the negative theta direction and just plug everything through. You see we get the uh, negative signs in the current canceling with the negative sign on the direction vector, unit vector, and we see that the average field here is, well, again from the magnetic field we saw we had a piecewise so we need to average the two by adding them together and taking the half. Um, again, useful. We've seen that before. So if we add this all together, simplify down, cancel everything that we can, blah blah blah, all that fancy stuff, what we see is that Bav is equal to mu naught m over 6, and we're left with a three-component vector. So 2z hat plus 2 cosine r hat plus sine phi hat, or sine theta hat, excuse me. And if we take df, which is uh, the current density cross b, da, run it through at little r equal r, so at the surface, what do we get? Well, we get theta cross z theta cross r and zero since theta cross theta hat is again a cross product of itself is zero. Um, move this through, good to go there. We're gonna leave theta cross z alone for now so we can use another vector identity, but we know that theta cross r is equal to phi hat and the coordinate system for spherical, so we'll plug that in. So dn, which is equal to big R since we're looking at the surface in the r hat direction cross df, okay, so the big R's cancel, but more importantly, what we see is that we have R hat cross theta hat cross Z hat minus cosine R cross V hat, okay? Again, we have that differential area element since we like to deal in differentials here. Now on that uh, R cross theta cross Z term, we use that same vector identity. So we have theta uh, times the dot product of R and Z minus Z times the dot product of R and theta minus cosine of negative theta. Again, R cross V, we see that a lot. Um, let's move this forward. Uh, we see here that R cross Z is equal to cosine theta, but R dotted with theta is equal to zero. It is just so happen to cancel out perfectly, um, which is why we like to use these identities. And now you see we're left with two uh, theta components, so that's really cool. So instead of computing manually all those cross products and getting something gross, using the vector identities save you a lot of space and a lot of time. A little bit of hindsight or seeing this trick once or twice will save you a lot of headache later, trust me. Uh, but nonetheless, we simplify that down and we see that we get a dn of mu naught m r squared over six pi dqdt times one plus cosine theta 
uh, times theta or cosine theta, d theta, d phi in the theta hat direction. All right, well, as you might expect, the only component that survives integration is the z component. So negative theta z gives you negative sine, gives us negative sine once we're done. So no double negatives here. We like that. And then, of course, uh, to find the torque, just take the integral, 0 to 2 pi, 0 to pi, respectively, plug in the direction. And, uh, yeah, good to go. Cancel it down, see what you can get. Um, again, for these integrals, I like using Symbol Lab. It makes the substitutions easy. Uh, let it boil down. You see that the torque eventually settles down to negative 2 over mu naught um, divided by 9, m big R squared, d q d t in the z hat. Um, now, if we integrate over respect all of time for the angular momentum, what we see is that we start it with some q, we go to 0 because we're draining it with the current, and again, we get the same result. And to me, that is just simply fascinating. What a wonderful uh, consistency and correspondence.